and we haven't even scratched the surface of what the Lord wants to do in our lives. We are continuing to become effective Christians. We want to become effective in all that we do. You have to remain in student mode every step of the way. How many people are in student mode? Say amen. 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 So um, the name of the service this morning or uh, today is, uh, there's a reason I left it like that, is figure it out in faith. Figure it out in faith. I want y'all to say that real loud. Say figure it out. Figure it out. Faith. In faith. Amen. We're reading from the book of Mark, Mark 11, uh, Mark 11, and we're starting from um, verse 12. Jesus and his disciples are headed to Jerusalem because it's Passover time, and uh, they're two miles away in Bethany, um, and it's Passover time. Passover, we want to make sure that we explain what Passover is. Passover is a time of celebration when, from when the Lord's uh, death angel passed over and spared the Israelites and infected, uh, inflicted, I'm sorry, inflicted death on all of the firstborn of the children of Egypt. And so that it passed over the Israelites and it inflicted death on the children of Egypt. And so uh, we're going to talk about, like we joked about and said, figure it out. We're going to talk about the fig this morning. Um, Israel, time and time again, uh, wavered in faith. Anybody ever known anybody to waver in faith when it comes to the Lord? How many, how many Christians in here have wavered before, went in the wrong direction, thought the wrong thing, did the wrong thing? He said, forgive, you didn't forgive. He said, go this way, you went that way. He said, turn right, how many people went left? You know, he's the, we've done that all the time. And so the funny thing about it is when the Lord tells us to do something, like the Lord may say, I need you to go 410 uh, westbound. And when you go 410 westbound, I need you to exit Vance Jackson and take a left. How many people will go right sometimes in the Lord? How many people have done that before? You, you know what the Lord tells you to do, but you don't listen. And so for us as Christians, we're works in progress. We're growing and changing and adapting to everything that the Lord wants us to do. The Israelites at this time had many opportunities, uh, but they would reject God. They would not listen to the Lord. And so um, we're reading from verse 12, chapter 11, verse 12. We're reading verse 12 and 13. It says, the next day Jesus was leaving Bethany. Remember, that's two miles from Jerusalem. And he was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. Now, I want to explain this to you. Um, the fig leaf, it says, first of all, that it's in leaf. The, the, the fig tree is in leaf. And so during Passover, Passover normally runs typically between March and April, when during the Passover, fig trees around Jerusalem typically grow their leaves. They don't have the figs yet, but they typically grow their leaves because they're preparing for the figs. And so that's a sign that the figs are soon to come. Well, it was different uh, with this tree, because this tree already had all of its leaves, it was it should already have evidence of figs. It should have figs on it. And so this tree was blossoming before time. It had everything that it needed, so it should have figs on it. So Jesus walked to this tree, and he seen that, uh, so he's looking for some food because he's hungry, and he didn't find a fig on it. And so normally, uh, if we're talking about the fig tree, um, March and April, the leaves would come, and then by June, it would have figs. But this tree was already blossoming and should have had figs already. So it's full of leaves. It should already have figs, but it doesn't. And so Jesus then says, verse 13, it says, When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not in the season for figs. And so... Where there are leaves, when we know that the fig tree has all of its leaves, there should be evidence of fruit. I'm getting somewhere with this. Mm -hmm. Where there are leaves, there should be evidence of fruit. And I want you to write this down, whatever the Lord puts on your heart this morning, I want you to write this down. Where there are leaves, there should be evidence of fruit. The tree had all the signs of opportunity to be fruitful, meaning it had all of its leaves. It had all of its leaves already, so 
it's definitely blossoming. It should have had figs when Jesus walked up to it. But it didn't have figs. It still it, it failed to produce results even though it had a jump on opportunity. It failed to produce results even though it had a jump on all opportunity. Meaning there were other trees, fig trees, that probably did not have the fruit on it at the time, did not have the leaves on it at the time, but they, they weren't like this other fig tree that was ahead of the schedule and had opportunity. And so we have to know what the fig represents in order for it to affect us in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so this fig, if we're talking the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the fig represented Israel. Israel had God with them, had the God walking with them, had God with them through every trial, through every tribulation, but they continued to doubt God. Anybody ever doubted God before? And so Israel in the Old Testament is what the, the fig represents. So what does it represent in the New Testament? It represents the, the religious leaders in the New Testament who continue to doubt God even though they had God in the flesh, which was Jesus, in front of them. They continue to doubt God. So what does it represent now? If we're talking about now, because we know what it represented in the Old Testament, and we know what it represented in the New Testament with Jesus walking the earth. But what does it represent now? Today it represents the church, not just any church, but the church that re refuses to produce fruit. And so we've got to know what is fruit, what is the importance of it, and how do we produce fruit as a Christian church? And so Jesus, first of all, he speaks to the figless tree. He speaks to the tree that did not produce. He speaks to Israel who did not produce. He speaks to the religious leaders who did not produce. He speaks to a church that will not produce. This is what he said. Jesus speaks to the, uh, to the figless tree and in verse 14, this is what he says. May you know, uh, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard this. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. So what does that represent now? So Jesus, the one who is in authority, curses the tree for lack of fulfillment. How does that operate in our lives? How does that operate in the Israelites' lives? How does it operate in the, 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 the ones who chose to avoid God, the religious leaders who ran away from Jesus? How does it affect their lives? Well, let's read this. So what happens, Jesus said, may no one ever eat from you again. And then here's the important things, because we're going to skip to verse 20. But I, I want you to understand one thing here. Let's see what happens. The fig tree that has all the opportunity but has no production, which represents Israel, which represents the religious leaders, which represents the church. Verse 20 tells you what happens. Verse 20 says this, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, not us. Not us. Look at your other neighbor and say, not us. Not us. Look at me and say, we will do this in Blessed Kingdom Ministries. We will do this in Ministries. We are not figless. We are not figless. Amen. And so not only did the tree wither, but look what it says. It says in the morning they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Not only did the tree wither, but it withered from the roots. What does that mean? It means that there will be no more production from that fig tree. There will be no more opportunities from that fig tree. There will be no, the roots have died. The roots have withered. There are no more works coming from that fig tree. Why is that important? Well, if we're talking Old Testament Israel, Old Testament Israel, Israel doubted God. And when they doubted God, what did God do? Well, think about them in the wilderness. What happened? It was a three-week journey turned into 40 years of running from God. You, you see what I'm saying? So, the Old Testament, uh, Israel doubted God. The New Testament religious leaders doubted Jesus, who was the Son of God, who was right in front of them. They spent many years learning the Scripture, understanding the Scripture. But when the Scripture was right in front of them, what did they do? They ignored them. 
And so the other thing is what happens today. Old Testament Israel doubted God. New Testament Israel doubted Jesus, the Son of God. And the church could doubt the Holy Spirit movement of God. And that's what we want. We don't want to do. That's what we refuse to do. We will always listen to what God tells us to do as a ministry and not, not, not doubt the Holy Spirit's movement of God because how many people know that the Holy Spirit moves as he wants to? Yeah. Sometimes he'll tell you, Pastor, this is what I need you to do. Sometimes he'll tell you, I need you to retract that and add this. But if we get caught in religion, we can be just like those religious teachers who got caught up in the religion instead of the relationship. How many people want a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. And so the church could doubt the Holy Spirit's movement of God. Now the importance is understanding all three of them. All three of them are hindered because of one thing. The lack of faith. As children of God, you have to have faith that what God is telling you to do is what he wants you to do. You have to pray enough to trust that, okay, he's telling me to give this person this. I know that I don't have it for my life, but he's telling me to give this to, to somebody. The Lord has told me before, give this to somebody. Give money to this person. The Lord has told me, give them food. Give them this. Them. Look, look, you know, and the importance of, for us to understand is when he tells us to move. It's time for us to move. When he tells us to take a step, it's time for us to take a step. When he tells us to just have faith, it's time for us to just have faith. All three avenues involve faith in Jesus Christ. And so these three can be hindered by lack of faith. So Jesus gives a fix to the problem in verse 22. This is what he says. He says, have faith in God. Look at your neighbor and say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Look at your other neighbor and say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Look, that is important that you speak that upon them. It's important that you say, brother or sister, I need you to have faith in God. I need you to trust. See, you don't know what everybody's experiencing in their lives. And when you say that, you speak it into their hearts. And what they're going through makes them understand that the Lord is saying, have faith in what I've provided you with. And so it's important, Jesus gives a fix in saying, have faith in God. And in verse 22, he continues to say uh, something else. He says, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, oh my goodness, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believe that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Amen. Did you hear that, believer? It also says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, be, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Look at your neighbor and say, it's mine. It's mine. And when you stand Praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. Look, you have to understand it's real simple. You cannot please God without faith. You cannot, you can't please him without faith. You can go to church a thousand times but not please God because you don't have faith to trust him with everything that you have. You cannot walk this walk without faith. You can say, I want to follow Jesus, but if you don't have faith, you're not going to follow him. Because why? When the first opportunity of offense, when the first opportunity of attacks come against you, what happens to us? We're gone. How many people have had that happen in their lives? How many people have had their faith tested? You say, I trust God. What did the rich young ruler do? Right. The rich young ruler said, I have everything. I've done all this other stuff. And what did Jesus say? Give all you have to the poor and follow me. And because he didn't have faith, all that other stuff didn't matter. 
So for us as Christians, we got to have faith. We got to trust God with our with the ailment that we have in our body. Trust God with a sickness that tried to come upon us. Trust God with our children. Trust God with our money. Trust God with yeah. our church. You got to trust him with everything yeah. you have. Yeah. You got to be willing to take yeah. off your yeah. shoes when he says to take off your shoes. Yes. You give everything to God. Amen. You let everything go. Amen. And you honor the Lord. Yeah. This church that's all we're going to do. We're going to have faith in our Lord and Savior. We're going to do what he tells us to do. We're going to do what he tells us to do when he tells us to do it. Why? Because without faith, we're not going to please him. We can have thousands of people in here, but if we don't have faith, we have nothing. But if we can have two in here, but with faith, we can remove a mountain Amen. that is in our lives. So, you cannot walk this walk without faith. The level of your, here's what I want you to write down. Because everybody, sometimes we forget this, but I want everybody to remember this. The level of your faith must be tested. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. If everybody, look at your neighbor and say, you too. You too. Everybody's faith in this room who have chosen to accept Jesus. Look, look at your other neighbor and say, you too. You too. Everybody, in, look, some of y'all like, not me, you holding back, you trying to. No, everybody in this room who has trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your faith will be tested. No matter how much money you have, how much success you have, how much money you don't have, your faith will be tested. Why? Because without the faith being tested, you can't see the level of where you're at. So the level of your faith must be tested, not just normal. It's un see, we think it's going to be tested like a calm little test. We think that the Lord's going to see your bag of faithful things and all those things. You got your money, your friends, your family, your children, and all this other stuff in the bag. You think he's going to take that one thing, maybe in the middle, but he's going to reach the very bottom. And he's going to take that one thing that is a mountain in your life, and he's going to test you with it. How many people are ready for that? <laughs> Let the record show that hands were wavering. In faith, the hands were scared to come up. And so, the, the awesomeness in understanding this is that your level of faith must be tested, not just normal tests, but it has to be impossible tests. Why? Because we're doing the impossible in the kingdom of God. Yeah. To much given, much is required. Yeah. God requires more of us. We want to do more as a ministry. We want to do more in the kingdom of God. So we're going to have more tests. Yes. Yeah. Our faith is going to be tested unbelievably. Why? Because we are children of God and we have chose to take on this mantle that he has given us. Amen. So, your faith must be tested. It's not normal test. It's impossible test. It's going to be a test that you can't handle without God. It's going to be impossible in your life. It's going to be something that you hold in your dear bosom and you're scared to let it go. Those are the things that God is going to attempt you to let go. He's going to put it in front of you. He's going to snatch it away from you. Why? Because without it, you have to have faith in God. If your stability is money, sometimes he removes it away from you. Why? To see if you have faith in him. Sometimes he may shake you up a little bit in your health because he wants you to have faith in him. Sometimes he may shake up your job or shake up your children because he wants you to have faith in him. But whatever it is, it's a mountain that he's going to put in front of you that you cannot remove without prayer and belief in God. <laughs> Y'all thought it was going to be easy faith, right? You thought you could be tested on simple stuff, right? You thought it'd be tested on things that you can do by yourself. The pastor said, well, you know, we need you to, to come and help. Oh, I can go and help. We need you to do this. Oh, I can go and do this. It's going to be the things that you say, I can't do that by yourselves. It's going to be the thing that you look at and you say, man, I got to cry out to God because there's no way this is going to happen without him. 
Anybody ever had that happen to them before? Amen. Anybody ever had the faith tested to where you're crying, not crying to the Lord, but crying because of what happened is so detrimental to your life? Anybody ever had that scream out to yeah. God before? Yeah. That is the faith we're talking about. It makes you cry. It makes you waver. It makes you shaky. It makes you need a friend to talk to you. That friend who comes to you at the right moment and says, Lord, send me to you to pray for you this morning. Anybody ever had that happen? Amen. Amen. This is what we're talking about this morning. It's unshakable. It's, it's a faith that, that will shake your, your foundation, that will destroy all that you thought you were and teach you to trust God. That's the faith we're talking about this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Say it real loud. Say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Look into their spirit. Say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Let's read verse 23. Verse 23 says again, it says, if anyone says in his mouth, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their hearts, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Then it says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, I want you to underline that. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Amen. There's some keys to this. And when you stand in, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. Look, these, when you look at mountains, as humans, when we look at mountains, if somebody tells you to go move that mountain, you look at that mountain, you say, man, there's no way I'm going to move that mountain. Why do you think Jesus uses the mountain? He uses the mountain for you to get the picture of something that's immovable in your life. Something that's immovable in front of you. And so when you see something that's immovable, it's immovable with the world and with your help, but it's very movable with the Lord God Almighty. Amen. So mountains are movable, immovable, but with Christ they are movable. You cannot move them with a hammer. You can't move them with a bulldozer. You can do your best. The Lord said, I need you to move that mountain. And you, you drive up with your little boat bulldozer and you drive into the mountain and nothing happens. I need you to remove that mountain. You, you, you walk up there with your hammer and you knock a rock off, but the mountain is still there. I need you to remove the mountain. You go up there, you kick the, kick the mountain, nothing happens. And so to, in order to remove a mountain, you have to have faith in the one who created the mountain. Not faith in yourself, but faith in the one who created the mountain. And so you have to move them by faith. And Jesus instructed them on, on a few things here. He said to pray, he said to believe, and it will be done. I want you to write this down. Prayer must be in the will of God not in the fear of the results. <laughs> Did y'all get that? Prayer must be in the will of God, not in the fear of the results. Sometimes we, we, we fear the results, God, but we have that emergency prayer. God's not looking for the emergency prayer. He's looking for your heart. Where is your heart? If you trust him, and you don't need the emergency prayer. You just trust him in your normal prayer. Right. And so he doesn't, he's not looking for the emergency prayer. God, I, if I don't have the bill paid by tomorrow, I'm going to, like he doesn't know what's going on in your life. Anybody ever had that? He's not looking for the emergency prayer. He's looking for the faith prayer. God, I trust you with all that you've done in my life. Lord, if it's your will, you'll take care of this bill. If it's not your will, Lord, thy will be done. Whatever you want to happen, Lord, if I'm outside the house, if I lose the house, I'd rather lose the house than have you than to have the house without you. When you trust God, fear will not reside. Write that down. When you trust God, fear will not reside. Fear, when we use the acronym for fear, is false evidence appearing real. It is not real. It ain't even happened yet, and yet you feel it. So when you trust God, fear will not reside. Look, it may knock at your door. Anybody ever had fear knock at your door before? It may ring your doorbell and look for you to come outside. It may want you to open it up and let them in or let it in. But it's just fear. It's not real. And those who, act, who pray and believe in God's will shall receive. Amen. What does that mean? 
Everything you do should be in God's will. Look, if it's your will that I have this house, if, you're, if it's your will that I have this car, if it's your will that my child goes to this school, if it's your will that I be healed, if it's your will that my relationship be restored, it should all be in God's will, not your will, but his. What does the prayer say? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You want heaven to come down on earth. How does heaven come down on earth? You trust God more than you trust your current situation. Amen. Those who pray and believe, remember, write this key thing down. Pray and believe in God's will, not your own. Some people say, well, I asked him for healing, but he didn't give it to me. It's not the healing you're looking for. You're looking for his will. Lord, whatever you want to happen tomorrow will happen. So he says, but whatever those who pray and believe shall receive. I didn't say that, Jesus said that. I want you to look up here and I want you to say this real loud. Say, give us an example, pastor. Say it real loud. Give us an example. Give, give us an example, example pastor. pastor. Say it real loud again. Give, give us an example, example pastor. pastor. Look, I want you to know something because it's so important that we have testimonies here and tell you what's going on in the ministry that you pray for. We need you to understand what he does. Not just in your lives, but in all of our lives. Why? Because we are blessed. We are blessed kingdom ministry. Not because pastor says so or his wife says so, but because the Lord God Almighty says so. He created this ministry. He put it in effect. He gave it the name. So I need you to understand what's going on here. When I was admitted to the hospital in March 1, remember March 1, I want you to remember that. When I was admitted in the hospital on March 1, I had no insurance. I'm not ashamed to say that because I'm giving all glory to God, not to anybody else. When I was uh, uh, admitted in the hospital on March 1st, I had no insurance. When I was released from the hospital on March 4th, guess what? I still had no insurance. Anybody know that? <laughs> I went in and came out with no insurance. Anybody ever had that happen before? <laughs> you prayed. You didn't know what you were praying for. You believed. You didn't know what you were believing for. You just knew that God had that child of God in, 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 in the hospital and you wanted to lift him up, pray for him, whatever he needs. You prayed for me. Amen. I felt him. You prayed and believed with me that he would heal and restore me. I applied for assistance and was turned down because I made too much to receive assistance but not enough to pay the bill. Anybody ever had that before? <laughs> it's a, you make too much, not enough. And so I received a bill from the hospital. I want you to take this and write it down because this is the truth as God is my witness. He's always, always my witness. I got a bill from the hospital that was a little over $47,000 for three, four days. I didn't fear at all. I didn't even worry about it. I just gave all honor and glory to God. Me and my brother in Christ lifted it up and gave it to God and said, whatever you do, Lord, I know I didn't qualify for anything, but I always qualify for the kingdom of God because I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Days later, I received another bill from the same hospital for another $500. I'm mad now. I'm sitting there. I, I'm, con I, I'm, I'm contacting them saying, well, why didn't you just combine them both? Why you going to give me one? And then, you know, you going to give me 47? Give me 47, five. Why give me 47? And then give me five. Throw a little five. And they, they, they may throw another one in and say, we got a $20 bill. No, just give them all at once. <laughs> Round it off the 48 if you have to. And so I contacted the hospital to find out why both bills were not combined. The lady placed me on hold. She said, hold on a second, let me go talk to my, my boss. She went and talked to me, her boss, because she said something didn't look right. She went and talked to the boss, she came back and she said, Mr. Gray, your bill has been partially forgiven for $46,500. So Paul, what, 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 what do you mean by that, partially forgiven? It means you do not owe $46,500. All you owe is $500. I didn't qualify for yeah. anything. Nothing came through. But for whatever reason, the Lord God Almighty paid the bill for me for $46,500. Can you give God yeah. honor? Yeah. The Lord. Amen. Now, 
my next question was, do you take check or cash? <laughs> you take credit card, whatever, you know, I'll come up there and get blood if I have to. But I wanted to get that over with because the Lord removed the mountain. I could not remove it when I tried to, come to, try to apply for everything. And he made it obvious. And I told my wife, I was like, I don't know what happened, but $46,500 just disappeared from my account. Yeah. Yeah. And all I had was $500 left. Thank you, Father. Something I can do. And so I, I tell you this because you don't have to understand it all. You just have to have faith in your Lord and Savior. Amen. You, you, you don't have to understand it all. You just have to do, make an opportunity, take the walk. Don't just become leaves, but become figs. Don't, see, churches sometimes stop at the leave stage and never become figs. What I'm telling you today is we refuse to just become leaves. We want to become leaves and figs and be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Amen. And God has given us evidence by disappearing $46,500 for no reason at all. I want you to understand something else he revealed to me last night. <laughs> I planned this service when God gave it to me. But he planned to reveal something to me last night. He says, you're talking about March. March 1st is when this happens. March 1st is what you're reading, or, or, or March and April represents the Passover celebration. Mm -hmm. So I want you to understand something. Just like the death angel passed over the Israelites, the death demon passed over Pastor Larry Gray. Why? Because God was with me. Yes. And he never left me nor forsake me. And so the prayers that you had made God, uh, made God move on my behalf and do the things he was planning to do anyways. And so through our faith, God removed that debt just because he wanted to, not because he had to. And I need you to understand something. How do you sum this up? Because I need you to apply it to your lives. This faith thing is real. If you really understand who God is, you'll understand it is real. We sum this up and apply it to our lives as believers like this. I want you to look at your neighbor again and say, figure it out. Figure it out. In faith. In faith. In faith. The figless tree today represents the church that does enough to have leaves, but not enough to have figs. Why? Because they lack faith. We refuse to lack faith in this church. We will do the will of God. If you don't like that, then you'll be at another church. But today, I am telling you, Blessed Kingdom Ministry will do the work of God. Yes. We will cultivate our spiritual roots and never settle for leaves. We are becoming unplugged. We will do the will of God. No matter what he wants us to do, we will do the will of God. Do you hear me? I want you to say it real loud. Say, I will. I will. Do the will of God. Do the will of God. Say, we will. We will. Do the will of God. Do the will of God. We will cultivate our spiritual roots and never settle for leaves. The Lord's favor is upon us. By faith, he blesses us and removes mountains. Removes mountains. Do you understand what he just did? Do you understand that there's no explanation on why he did it just because he loves us? He's saying that y'all prayers were answered. He's saying that my faith has demolished, has demolished the debt. He says it's paid. And he did it on purpose. He said, I'm not going to let you qualify for anything because if you qualify for something, you'll say the qualification did it. I'm going to let you qualify for nothing. Why? So that when I remove it, you'll know 100% yeah. that it was Lord Jesus, Lord God, yeah. the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, who removed all that debt from you. Yeah. There is nobody else who can tell me anything else except God was with me. So, we must continue to proclaim his kingdom to all the earth. We have to figure it out in faith. 
There is no weapon that can form against us that will prosper. Every tongue that rises against the men and the women of God shall be condemned. No evil shall befall us, for God has given his angels charge over us, and they keep us in all our ways. Greater is the one that is in us than the one that is in the world. There is nothing that can take us away or remove us from the hands of God. Not, 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 not powers or principalities, angels or demons. There is nothing that can remove blessed kingdom ministries from the hands of God. Amen. Your friends, your families can try it, but there is nobody who can remove us from the hands of God. If you believe that, I need you to stand up and give God a shout of praise like you've never done that.